international short stories volume three french stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by bruce peary international short stories volume three french stories compiled and translated by francis j reynolds solange dr ledru's story of the reign of terror by alexandre dumas leaving la baie i walked straight across the place touraine to the rue tournant where i had lodgings when i heard a woman scream for help it could not be an assault to commit robbery for it was hardly ten o'clock in the evening i ran to the corner of the place whence the sounds proceeded and by the light of the moon just then breaking through the clouds i beheld a woman in the midst of a patrol of sans culottes the lady observed me at the same instant and seeing by the character of my dress that i did not belong to the common order of people she ran toward me exclaiming there is monsieur albert he knows me he will tell you that i am the daughter of madame le dur the laundress with these words the poor creature pale and trembling with excitement seized my arm and clung to me as a shipwrecked sailor to a spar no matter whether you are the daughter of madame le dur or some one else as you have no pass you must go with us to the guard-house the young girl pressed my arm i perceived in this pressure the expression of her great distress of mind i understood it so it is you my poor solange i said what are you doing here there monsieur she exclaimed in tones of deep anxiety do you believe me now you might at least say citizens ah oh, sergeant do not blame me for speaking that way said the pretty young girl my mother has many customers among the great people and taught me to be polite that's how i acquired this bad habit the habit of the aristocrats and you know sergeant it's so hard to shake off old habits this answer delivered in trembling accents concealed a delicate irony that was lost on all save me i asked myself who is this young woman the mystery seemed complete this alone was clear she was not the daughter of a laundress how did i come here citizen albert she asked well i will tell you i went to deliver some washing the lady was not at home and so i waited for in these hard times every one needs what little money is coming to him in that way it grew dark and so i fell among these gentlemen beg pardon i would say citizens they asked for my pass as i did not have it with me they were going to take me to the guard-house i cried out in terror which brought you to the scene and as luck would have it you are a friend i said to myself as monsieur albert knows my name to be solange le dieu he will vouch for me and that you will will you not monsieur albert certainly i will vouch for you very well said the leader of the patrol and who pray will vouch for you my friend danton do you know him is he a good patriot oh if danton will vouch for you i have nothing to say well there is a session of the cordelier to-day let us go there good said the leader citizens let us go to the cordelier the club of the cordelier met at the old cordelier monastery in the rue l'observance we arrived there after scarce a minute's walk at the door i tore a page from my notebook wrote a few words upon it with a lead pencil gave it to the sergeant and requested him to hand it to danton while i waited outside with the men the sergeant entered the clubhouse and returned with danton what said he to me they have arrested you my friend you the friend of camille you one of the most loyal republicans citizens he continued addressing the sergeant i vouch for him is that sufficient you vouch for him do you also vouch for her asked the stubborn sergeant for her to whom do you refer this girl for everything for everybody who may be in his company does that satisfy you yes said the man especially since i have had the privilege of seeing you 
with a cheer for danton the patrol marched away i was about to thank danton when his name was called repeatedly within pardon me my friend he said you hear there is my hand i must leave you the left i gave my right to the sergeant who knows the good patriot may have scrofula i'm coming he exclaimed addressing those within in his mighty voice with which he could pacify or arouse the masses he hastened into the house i remained standing at the door alone with my unknown and now my lady i said whither would you have me escort you i am at your disposal why to madame le dieu she said with a laugh i told you she was my mother and where does madame le dieu reside rue ferru twenty four then let us proceed to rue ferru twenty four on the way neither of us spoke a word but by the light of the moon enthroned in serene glory in the sky i was able to observe her at my leisure she was a charming girl of twenty or twenty-two brunette with large blue eyes more expressive of intelligence than melancholy a finely chiselled nose mocking lips teeth of pearl hands like a queen's and feet like a child's and all these in spite of her costume of a laundress betokened an aristocratic air that had aroused the sergeant's suspicions not without justice arrived at the door of the house we looked at each other a moment in silence well my dear monsieur albert what do you wish my fair unknown asked with a smile i was about to say my dear mademoiselle solange that it was hardly worth while to meet if we are to part so soon oh i beg ten thousand pardons i find it was well worth the while for if i had not met you i should have been dragged to the guard-house and there it would have been discovered that i am not the daughter of madame le dieu in fact it would have developed that i am an aristocrat and in all likelihood they would have cut off my head you admit then that you are an aristocrat i admit nothing at least you might tell me your name solange i know very well that this name which i gave you on the inspiration of the moment is not your right name no matter i like it and i am going to keep it at least for you why should you keep it for me if we are not to meet again i did not say that i only said that if we should meet again it will not be necessary for you to know my name any more than that i should know yours to me you will be known as albert and to you i shall always be solange so be it then but i say solange i began i am listening albert she replied you are an aristocrat that you admit if i did not admit it you would surmise it and so my admission would be divested of half its merit and you were pursued because you were suspected of being an aristocrat i fear so and you are hiding to escape persecution in the rue ferru number twenty four with madame le dieu whose husband was my father's coachman you see i have no secret from you and your father i shall make no concealment my dear albert of anything that relates to me but my father's secrets are not my own my father is in hiding hoping to make his escape that is all i can tell you and what are you going to do go with my father if that be possible if not allow him to depart without me until the opportunity offers itself to me to join him were you coming from your father when the guard arrested you to-night yes listen dearest solange i am all attention you observed all that took place to-night yes i saw that you had powerful influence i regret my power is not very great however i have friends i made the acquaintance of one of them and you know he is not one of the least powerful men of the times do you intend to enlist his influence to enable my father to escape 
no i reserve him for you but my father i have other ways of helping your father other ways exclaimed solange seizing my hands and studying me with an anxious expression if i serve your father will you then sometimes think kindly of me oh i shall all my life hold you in grateful remembrance she uttered these words with an enchanting expression of devotion then she looked at me beseechingly and said but will that satisfy you yes i said ah i was not mistaken you are kind generous i thank you for my father and myself even if you should fail i shall be grateful for what you have already done when shall we meet again solange when do you think it necessary to see me again to-morrow when i hope to have good news for you well then to-morrow where here here in the street well mon dieu she exclaimed you see it is the safest place for thirty minutes while we have been talking here not a soul has passed why may i not go to you or you come to me because it would compromise the good people if you should come to me and you would incur serious risk if i should go to you oh i would give you the pass of one of my relatives and send your relative to the guillotine if i should be accidentally arrested true i will bring you a pass made out in the name of solange charming you observe solange is my real name and the hour the same at which we met to-night ten o'clock if you please all right ten o'clock and how shall we meet that is very simple be at the door at five minutes of ten and at ten i will come down then at ten to-morrow dear solange to-morrow at ten dear albert i wanted to kiss her hand she offered me her brow the next day i was in the street at half-past nine at a quarter of ten solange opened the door we were both ahead of time with one leap i was by her side i see you have good news she said excellent first here is a pass for you first my father she repelled my hand your father is saved if he wishes wishes you say what is required of him he must trust me that is assured have you seen him yes you have discussed the situation with him it was unavoidable heaven will help us did you tell your father all i told him you had saved my life yesterday and that you would perhaps save his to-morrow to-morrow yes quite right to-morrow i shall save his life if it is his will how what speak speak if that were possible how fortunately all things have come to pass however i began hesitatingly well it will be impossible for you to accompany him i told you i was resolute i am quite confident however that i shall be able later to procure a passport for you first tell me about my father my own distress is less important well i told you i had friends did i not yes to-day i sought out one of them proceed a man whose name is familiar to you whose name is a guarantee of courage and honour and this man is marceau general marceau yes true he will keep a promise well he has promised mon dieu how happy you make me what has he promised tell me all he has promised to help us in what manner in a very simple manner clebe has just had him promoted to the command of the western army he departs to-morrow night to-morrow night we shall have no time to make the smallest preparation there are no preparations to make i do not understand he will take your father with him my father yes as his secretary arrived in the vendee your father will pledge his word to the general to undertake nothing against france from there he will escape to brittany and from brittany to england 
when he arrives in london he will inform you i shall obtain a passport for you and you will join him in london to-morrow exclaimed solange my father departs to-morrow there is no time to waste my father has not been informed inform him to-night to-night but how at this hour you have a pass and my arm true my pass i gave it to her she thrust it into her bosom now your arm i gave her my arm and we walked away when we arrived at the place turenne that is the spot where we had met the night before she said await me here i bowed and waited she disappeared around the corner of what was formerly the hotel malignon after a lapse of fifteen minutes she returned come she said my father wishes to receive and thank you she took my arm and led me up to the rue st guillaume opposite the hotel mortemart arrived there she took a bunch of keys from her pocket opened a small concealed door took me by the hand conducted me up two flights of steps and knocked in a peculiar manner a man of forty-eight or fifty years opened the door he was dressed as a working man and appeared to be a bookbinder but at the first utterance that burst from his lips the evidence of the seigneur was unmistakable monsieur he said providence has sent you to us i regard you an emissary of fate is it true that you can save me or what is more that you wish to save me i admitted him completely to my confidence i informed him that marceau would take him as his secretary and would exact no promise other than that he would not take up arms against france i cheerfully promise it now and will repeat it to him i thank you in his name as well as in my own but when does marceau depart to-morrow shall i go to him to-night whenever you please he expects you father and daughter looked at each other i think it would be wise to go this very night said solange i am ready but if i should be arrested seeing that i have no permit here is mine but you oh i am known where does marceau reside rue de l'université forty with his sister mademoiselle de gravier marceau will you accompany me i shall follow you at a distance to accompany mademoiselle home when you are gone how will marceau know that i am the man of whom you spoke to him you will hand him this tricolored cockade that is the sign of identification and how shall i reward my liberator by allowing him to save your daughter also very well he put on his hat and extinguished the lights and we descended by the gleam of the moon which penetrated the stair windows at the foot of the steps he took his daughter's arm and by way of the rue des saint pères we reached rue de l'université i followed them at a distance of ten paces we arrived at number forty without having met any one i rejoined them there that is a good omen i said do you wish me to go up with you no do not compromise yourself any further await my daughter here i bowed and now once more thanks and farewell he said giving me his hand language has no words to express my gratitude i pray that heaven may some day grant me the opportunity of giving fuller expression to my feelings i answered him with a pressure of the hand he entered the house solange followed him but she too pressed my hand before she entered in ten minutes the door was reopened well i asked your friend she said is worthy of his name he is as kind and considerate as yourself he knows that it will contribute to my happiness to remain with my father until the moment of departure his sister has ordered a bed placed in her room to-morrow at three o'clock my father will be out of danger to-morrow evening at ten i shall expect you in the rue ferru if the gratitude of a daughter who owes her father's life to you is worth the trouble oh be sure i shall come did your father charge you with any message for me 
he thanks you for your pass which he returns to you and begs you to join him as soon as possible whenever it may be your desire to go i said with a strange sensation at my heart at least i must know where i am to join him she said ah you are not yet rid of me i seized her hand and pressed it against my heart but she offered me her brow as on the previous evening and said until to-morrow i kissed her on the brow but now i no longer strained her hand against my breast but her heaving bosom her throbbing heart i went home in a state of delirious ecstasy such as i had never experienced was it the consciousness of a generous action or was it love for this adorable creature i know not whether i slept or woke i only know that all the harmonies of nature were singing within me that the night seemed endless and the day eternal i know that though i wished to speed the time i did not wish to lose a moment of the days still to come the next day i was in the rue ferru at nine o'clock at half-past nine solange made her appearance she approached me and threw her arms around my neck saved she said my father is saved and this i owe you oh how i love you two weeks later solange received a letter announcing her father's safe arrival in england the next day i brought her a passport when solange received it she burst into tears you do not love me she exclaimed i love you better than my life i replied but i pledged your father my word and i must keep it then i will break mine she said yes albert if you have the heart to let me go i have not the courage to leave you alas she remained three months had passed since that night on which we talked of her escape and in all that time not a word of parting had passed her lips solange had taken lodgings in the rue Turenne. i had rented them in her name i knew no other while she always addressed me as albert i had found her a place as teacher in a young lady's seminary solely to withdraw her from the espionage of the revolutionary police which had become more scrutinizing than ever sundays we passed together in the small dwelling from the bedroom of which we could see the spot where we had first met we exchanged letters daily she writing to me under the name of solange and i to her under that of albert those three months were the happiest of my life in the meantime i was making some interesting experiments suggested by one of the guillotiniers i had obtained permission to make certain scientific tests with the bodies and heads of those who perished on the scaffold sad to say available subjects were not wanting not a day passed but thirty or forty persons were guillotined and blood flowed so copiously on the place de la revolution that it became necessary to dig a trench three feet deep around the scaffolding this trench was covered with deals one of them loosened under the feet of an eight-year-old lad who fell into the abominable pit and was drowned for self-evident reasons i said nothing to solange of the studies that occupied my attention during the day in the beginning my occupation had inspired me with pity and loathing but as time wore on i said these studies are for the good of humanity for i hoped to convince the lawmakers of the wisdom of abolishing capital punishment the cemetery of clamart had been assigned to me and all the heads and trunks of the victims of the executioner had been placed at my disposal a small chapel in one corner of the cemetery had been converted into a kind of laboratory for my benefit you know when the queens were driven from the palaces god was banished from the churches every day at six the horrible procession filed in the bodies were heaped together in a wagon the heads in a sack i chose some bodies and heads in a haphazard fashion while the remainder were thrown into a common grave in the midst of this occupation with the dead 
my love for solange increased from day to day while the poor child reciprocated my affection with the whole power of her pure soul often i had thought of making her my wife often we had mutually pictured to ourselves the happiness of such a union but in order to become my wife it would be necessary for solange to reveal her name and this name which was that of an emigrant an aristocrat meant death her father had repeatedly urged her by letter to hasten her departure but she had informed him of our engagement she had requested his consent and he had given it so that all had gone well to this extent the trial and execution of the queen marie antoinette had plunged me too into deepest sadness solange was all tears and we could not rid ourselves of a strange feeling of despondency a presentiment of approaching danger that compressed our hearts in vain i tried to whisper courage to solange weeping she reclined in my arms and i could not comfort her because my own words lacked the ring of confidence we passed the night together as usual but the night was even more depressing than the day i recall now that a dog locked up in a room below us howled till two o'clock in the morning the next day we were told that the dog's master had gone away with the key in his pocket had been arrested on the way tried at three and executed at four the time had come for us to part solange's duties at the school began at nine o'clock in the morning her school was in the vicinity of the botanic gardens i hesitated long to let her go she too was loath to part from me but it must be solange was prone to be an object of unpleasant inquiries i called a conveyance and accompanied her as far as the rue des fosses saint bernard where i got out and left her to pursue her way alone all the way we lay mutely wrapped in each other's arms mingling tears with our kisses after leaving the carriage i stood as if rooted to the ground i heard solange call me but i dared not go to her because her face moist with tears and her hysterical manner were calculated to attract attention utterly wretched i returned home passing the entire day in writing to solange in the evening i sent her an entire volume of love pledges my letter had hardly gone to the post when i received one from her she had been sharply reprimanded for coming late had been subjected to a severe cross-examination and threatened with forfeiture of her next holiday but she vowed to join me even at the cost of her place i thought i should go mad at the prospect of being parted from her a whole week i was more depressed because a letter which had arrived from her father appeared to have been tampered with i passed a wretched night and a still more miserable day the next day the weather was appalling nature seemed to be dissolving in a cold ceaseless rain a rain like that which announces the approach of winter all the way to the laboratory my ears were tortured with the criers announcing the names of the condemned a large number of men women and children the bloody harvest was over rich i should not lack subjects for my investigations that day the day ended early at four o'clock i arrived at clamart it was almost night the view of the cemetery with its large new-made graves the sparse leafless trees that swayed in the wind was desolate almost appalling a large open pit yawned before me it was to receive to-day's harvest from the place de la revolution an exceedingly large number of victims was expected for the pit was deeper than usual mechanically i approached the grave at the bottom the water had gathered in a pool my feet slipped i came within an inch of falling in my hair stood on end the rain had drenched me to the skin i shuddered and hastened into the laboratory it was as i have said an abandoned chapel 
my eyes searched i know not why to discover if some traces of the holy purpose to which the edifice had once been devoted did not still adhere to the walls or to the altar but the walls were bare the altar empty i struck a light and deposited the candle on the operating table on which lay scattered a miscellaneous assortment of the strange instruments i employed i sat down and fell into a reverie i thought of the poor queen whom i had seen in her beauty glory and happiness yesterday carted to the scaffold pursued by the execrations of a people to-day lying headless on the common sinner's bier she who had slept beneath the gilded canopy of the throne of the tuileries and saint cloud as i sat thus absorbed in gloomy meditation wind and rain without redoubled in fury the raindrops dashed against the window panes the storm swept with melancholy moaning through the branches of the trees anon there mingled with the violence of the elements the sound of wheels it was the executioner's red hearse with its ghastly freight from the place de la revolution the door of the little chapel was pushed ajar and two men drenched with rain entered carrying a sack between them there monsieur ledru said the guillotinier there is what your heart longs for be in no hurry this night we'll leave you to enjoy their society alone orders are not to cover them up till to-morrow and so they'll not take cold with a horrible laugh the two executioners deposited the sack in a corner near the former altar right in front of me thereupon they sauntered out leaving open the door which swung furiously on its hinges till my candle flashed and flared in the fierce draught i heard them unharness the horse lock the cemetery and go away i was strangely impelled to go with them but an indefinable power fettered me in my place i could not repress a shudder i had no fear but the violence of the storm the splashing of the rain the whistling sounds of the lashing branches the shrill vibration of the atmosphere which made my candle tremble all this filled me with a vague terror that began at the roots of my hair and communicated itself to every part of my body suddenly i fancied i heard a voice a voice at once soft and plaintive a voice within the chapel pronouncing the name of albert i was startled albert but one person in all the world addressed me by that name slowly i directed my weeping eyes around the chapel which though small was not completely lighted by the feeble rays of the candle leaving the nooks and angles in darkness and my look remained fixed on the blood-soaked sack near the altar with its hideous contents at this moment the same voice repeated the same name only it sounded fainter and more plaintive albert i bolted out of my chair frozen with horror the voice seemed to proceed from the sack i touched myself to make sure that i was awake then i walked toward the sack with my arms extended before me but stark and staring with horror i thrust my hand into it then it seemed to me as if two lips still warm pressed a kiss upon my fingers i had reached that stage of boundless terror where the excess of fear turns into the audacity of despair i seized the head and collapsing in my chair placed it in front of me then i gave vent to a fearful scream this head with its lips still warm with the eyes half closed was the head of solange i thought i should go mad three times i called solange 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 at the third time she opened her eyes and looked at me tears trickled down her cheeks then a moist glow darted from her eyes as if the soul were passing and the eyes closed never to open again 
i sprang to my feet a raving maniac i wanted to fly i knocked against the table it fell the candle was extinguished the head rolled upon the floor and i fell prostrate as if a terrible fever had stricken me down an icy shudder convulsed me and with a deep sigh i swooned the following morning at six the gravediggers found me cold as the flagstones on which i lay solange betrayed by her father's letter had been arrested the same day condemned and executed the head that had called me the eyes that had looked at me were the head the eyes of solange end of solange by alexandre dumas